I apologize in advance, but I'm going to ask you to stand up one more time. Uh, stand with me and turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. We're going to read all of chapter 23 and the first dozen verses of chapter 4. Although we're not going to focus on all of this this morning, we will be uh, focusing on verse 26 onward, but um, I'd like to give you a fuller picture of the last hours of Jesus' life. So Luke 23 and verse 1. By the way, if you've come and you don't have a Bible, uh, there are some Bibles provided in the pew. You can take those home if you'd like. Uh, there are other books there as well that are free for the taking. Luke 23, beginning at verse 1. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And he learned that he had belonged to Herod's jurisdiction. He sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. And Herod, with the soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then, arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate, and Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that very day, for before this they had been at enmity with one another. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. But they cried out together, Away with this man, and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I found, him, found in him no guilt deserving of death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown in prison for inter insurrection and murder, for whom they had asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. And then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, 
his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, they returned home beating their breasts. And all of his acquaintances and the woman who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now there was a man, Joseph, from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in the tomb cut in stone where no one had, had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The woman who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared. Commandment, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you whilst he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Thus says the word of the living God. Let us pray. Father, we build our lives on your promises and on your word. We have hinged our lives on the work of Christ. And so as your servants, we have come this morning to feed upon your word. We ask that you would give us understanding by your spirit. And that your spirit would come and anoint us in a unique way such that we'd be able to take in every drop of truth that's here. On this Resurrection Sunday, Father, we ask that you would be with us especially. That you'd guide us, give us wisdom, give us soft hearts. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. The formal charges issued against Jesus by the religious leaders of Jerusalem was that Jesus had a claim to be a king over and against Caesar. Uh, This, of course, was not true. Rather, these men had uh, charged Jesus in this way because they perceived Jesus to be a threat to their place of prominence and their position of authority. And so these men being self-righteous and hypocritical, feared Christ because he was what they claimed to be. He was truly righteous, truly holy, and a good man, a servant of God. And so when they handed him over to Pilate, Pilate didn't initially want to kill him. 
But when Pilate was faced with a, a choice between a riot or crucifying an innocent man, well, he crucified the innocent man. But why did the people of Israel go along with that? Because while they're here shouting, crucify him, just a few days earlier they were singing his praises. I think it's because they're fickle. I think it's because they want a spectacle and they're easily swayed by their corrupt leaders. Why did Herod want Jesus dead? I think it's because Herod was fearful of Jesus, just as he was fearful of John the Baptist. I think Jesus' holy character confused him. But why the Roman soldiers? Well, they were under orders. They're also brutal, cruel, and violent men. And so the reasons for uh, murdering Christ, the motivations, the objections... They're all multifaceted. There's different reasons for the different groups. But here's what I want you to know. That in the same way these men intended for the brutal, premeditated murder of the Son of God, God intended for it. The Bible tells us that all of these things took place according to the foreordained, predestined plan of God. And that should scandalize you. That God desired to crush his own son. And the question is why? It is because through giving up of his one and only beloved son, he would in fact reconcile the world to himself. That by giving his son as a sacrificial lamb, as it were, he would in fact make a way for our salvation. And so my goal this morning in looking at the cross and empty tomb with you is to persuade you to consider this greatest story ever told. And my hope is that the Spirit of God will move upon your heart and draw you unto Christ. And whether you've been coming to this church for years or this is the first time you've darkened the doorway of a church, my hope is that you leave this place knowing you have peace with God through what Christ has achieved for you. And for those of you who are in the faith and who know the Lord, my hope is that these events encourage you, give you boldness in prayer, and empower you to live a life sacrificial to the glory of God. And so we're going to begin at verse 26 of chapter 23. Let me just remind you of a few of the items that have happened thus already. Uh, Jesus was betrayed by Judas, who was one of the twelve, a close friend of Christ. He served as a, an informant and guide to a mob comprised of Jewish temple police, uh, other temple officials, and Roman auxiliary troops. Uh, Judas identified Jesus by kissing him on the cheek, the most ironic form of betrayal. And Jesus was taken into custody and delivered over to the Sanhedrin in the temple. There he was given a kangaroo trial, a trial where there was no actual evidence presented against him, but conflicting opinions and anecdotes. And there Jesus was beaten severely with the fists of the men who were holding him, and he was handed over to Pilate. As I said, Pilate did not initially want to kill Jesus, and so instead he sought to punishing, punish him, hoping that that would uh, satiate the bloodlust of these Jewish leaders. And the form of punishment that Pilate gave Jesus was scourging. Scourging in and of itself was often fatal. And this is what it involved. They would have, after having beaten and mocked Jesus, chained him to a post stripping him of his clothes so his back is facing them. And then a Roman imperial soldier would take a whip that had a series of cords on the end of it. Embedded in these leather cords were bits of bone and shrapnel so that when Jesus was struck with this whip, it wasn't merely the impact of the whip that caused damage to him, but rather, it was the shrapnel embedding itself into his flesh and being ripped out just as quickly. 
And they did this to him over and over and over again so that the flesh from his back fell in ribbons. Uh, Scourging was known to cause permanent disability, fatality, extraordinary blood loss, and obviously great pain. So after scourging him, they begin to lead him to the place where he will be executed, but they decide to put on him a piece of the cross. So uh, the cross came in two pieces, a stake and what is called a patibulum, the cross piece, which would have weighed upwards of 100 pounds. They put this on Jesus' back, and likely because of the injuries and the loss of blood, uh, Jesus is not able to carry it. And so that's where we begin at verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And so the Roman authorities accost uh, passers-by, making this man Simon uh, carry the cross behind Jesus as they walk their way to the place where he would be crucified outside of the city. It's interesting to me that Simon is mentioned by name. It's actually quite unusual. Um, It's not often that you'll find little details like this in Luke's gospel where someone is specifically named. And so I think the reason why Simon is named, and not merely named, but also the location of where he is from, Cyrene is named as well, is because Simon was known to the early church when Luke wrote his gospel. Uh, That would mean that Simon, after having been involved in this monumental historical moment, uh, Simon being a Jew, it's a Jewish name, came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But think about the picture here. Here's Simon carrying the cross behind Jesus. Jesus taught us that if anyone would follow him, we must take up our cross, come after him. What Simon is doing is a very visceral portrayal of the Christian life, isn't it? So in the midst of this scene, as Jesus uh, goes marching on towards the place of his inevitable death, verse 27, there followed him a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. Among these women were Jesus' mother, watching them decimate her son and Jesus saw her so you might imagine what he was thinking you might imagine what she was thinking probably recalling to the times when she held her boy in her arms recalling times when he he was such a treasure to her in his youth And now here he is, completely innocent and yet condemned to die. And so Jesus, seeing this multitude, turns to them and says this, verse 28, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall in us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Notice here that Jesus' concern in the midst of this agony is with other people. Would you be thinking about other people? Were you in this situation? What Jesus is referring to here is the fact That God will judge Israel, not in the eschaton, at the end of days. Jesus is not describing the final reckoning with God in the world. He's talking about the fact that God will one day judge Israel. And in in fact, that did happen, didn't it? 70 AD, God used the nation of Rome as a judgment upon Israel, leveling the city of Jerusalem, destroying the temple, and effectively ending the religion of Judaism as it was known But it's amazing to me that even in the midst of this torture and this shame, he's concerned with others. Verse 32, two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. These were not small-time crooks. 
The Romans did not crucify anybody. A crucifixion was the punishment reserved when Rome needed to make an example out of someone. It was such a barbaric and horrendous form of torture and execution that, well, that was saved for the especially dastardly criminals. Like Barabbas, who was both an insurrectionist, guilty of spilling Roman blood likely, and a murderer. And so these men who are with Jesus, they are career criminals. They are violent men. And Jesus is among them, like he's one of them. Like he's one of their kind. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Why is this place called the skull? Or the Aramaic term is Golgotha, or the Latin translation is Calvary. Same meaning of all of those words. It means the skull. Uh, some have suggested that this place is called the skull because there is some kind of natural feature to the spot. Some kind of outcropping of rock that looks like a skull or something. There really isn't any evidence of that. There's no historical references of any kind. Others have suggested, well, that's where they crucify people, so they called it the skull. But I don't see the connection, because in crucifixion they impaled you. They didn't do anything to your head. So why the skull? I think there's a biblical reason. In Genesis chapter 3, we read of the fall of mankind into sin. Adam and Eve rebel against God, bringing death and sin into the world. And God finds out about it, so to speak. And he pronounces a prophetic judgment over Satan. He says, from the woman is going to come a seed, a child. And he will crush your head, Satan. And in so doing, you will bruise his heel. He will receive a wound unto himself. Keep that in mind. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath, a familiar story. David is not yet king. He is a shepherd boy. And he goes to the, uh, the front of the war between Israel and the Philistines to check in on his brothers who are enlisted in the army. And when he gets there, he hears this blasphemous Philistine warrior named Goliath just hurl insults at the people of Israel. And the deal is that Israel's going to send out their champion. The Philistines have their champion. They're going to save a lot of bloodshed and just have these two guys duke it out and, and see who wins the war. And all of Israel is terrified, right? Nobody wants to go out there. Even the king is like, I'm, I'm not going out there. So David somehow persuades the people of Israel to let him go out there to fight. And David, with the help of the Spirit of God, kills Goliath. And then chops off his head. 1 Samuel 17 tells us right at the end of the chapter that David would eventually take the head of Goliath to Jerusalem. Goliath, sort of like the archetypal enemy of God's people, representing everything ungodly. And David, really the archetypal king of Israel, the greatest king Israel ever had outside of Christ. Jesus is the son of David. It would be on the cross that he would crush the head of the serpent. It would be upon the cross that he would uh, effectively dismantle the works of the devil and destroy death itself. And I believe that's the place where Goliath's head's buried. That's why it's called the skull. It would be there that Jesus destroys our enemy. When modern day evangelicals read the story of David and Goliath, they read themselves into the passage. Maybe you've seen that before. You know, I'm David, Goliaths are my struggles. And with God's help, I can slay my giants. You're not David. Goliath isn't your struggles. Rather, Jesus is David, the son of David anyway. And Goliath represents sin, death, and the devil. You're one of the cowards back at the camp who's too scared to go out. And Jesus, in his great courage and self-sacrifice, is going to slay your giants for you. And indeed he did on that tree. And so Luke in a very 
understated way simply says there they crucified him. What did crucifixion involve? What they would have done with Jesus is after having arrived at the place of the skull, they would have laid him upon the assembled cross and they would have stretched out his arms and legs as far as they would go, uh, dislocating the joints to the point where if they pulled any further, his arms and legs would come off. So several large imperial troops would be there tugging on his extremities to get him stretched out as far as possible. And just where they were stretched out like that, they would drive a nail in, not into his hands and feet as commonly understood, but into his ankles and wrists. They did not nail crucifixion victims in their palms or the flat of their foot. If they did that, the person would fall off the cross. Their flesh would rip. Rather, it was universally through the wrists and ankles, which, by the way, the underlying Greek words translated hands and feet are equally applicable to wrists and ankles. They didn't distinguish between those parts. And so Jesus would have had nails, which are not the nails you find at the hardware store, but these are the ancient equivalent of railroad spikes, six to nine inches long, three quarters of an inch thick at their uh, thickest point. He would have had these driven through his ankles, destroying the bone, driven through his wrists. In other words, Jesus would never walk again this side of the grave. He'd never use his hands again. The damage done to his hands and feet would be utterly catastrophic. And then what they would do is they would take Jesus, now once impaled on the cross, they would drop the bottom of the stake into a pre-dug hole so that now he would be suspended by his wounds. Were that not bad enough, because of the stretching that that came before the nails, it became exceedingly difficult for the crucifixion victim to breathe because he stretched so far. And so in order to take a breath, the crucified would need to push up on the wound in order to allow their diaphragm to expand with air. This is a piece of rough cut timber. This is in a sanded piece of wood. So here's Jesus lifting himself up every single breath, rubbing his freshly wounded back on the wood just to breathe. Just to breathe. And this goes on for hours. Hours. Most crucifixion victims would not die from their injuries. They would die from asphyxiation. The reason for that is because they would eventually become so exhausted from lifting themselves up that they wouldn't be able to do it again and they would die that way. What we're talking about is an utterly barbaric, horrendous form of execution. And this is what they did to him along with two criminals on either side of him. You might recall earlier in the gospel account where James and John sort of presumptuously petitioned Jesus by way of their mother that they might be in his glory on his right hand and left, right? This is what that looks like. Because as we'll see, Jesus is most glorified on this cross. The moment of his greatest ignominy and humiliation is, in fact, the coronation of King Jesus. We'll see that in a few verses. And so there he hangs. And in the midst of this brutality, Jesus again speaks, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is that true? They didn't know what they were doing? No, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew precisely what they were doing. What Jesus means here is not, they don't recognize the brutality, the, the heartlessness, the barbarism of their actions. They do recognize that. They intend for that. What he's saying is, they don't recognize the repercussions of their actions. 
they don't recognize who they're doing this to. They don't see the implications of their actions. But notice, in the midst of this utter agony, Jesus is concerned with others, even the very people who are causing his affliction. They cast garments or cast lots to divide his garments, fulfilling the prophecy of Psalm 22, written long before the gospel accounts. And the people stood by watching, gawking at this scene. Like they're watching entertainment. But the rulers, well, they scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. Do you hear what they're saying? Do you hear what they're admitting? He saved others? What they're saying is, yeah, he saved others. He, he made a little dead girl come back to life. He came to a leper and touched him and healed him. He made a blind man see who was blind from birth. There was a man in the synagogue with an, a disability, a, a withered arm, and he made it regenerate right in front of them. The miracles were undeniable. The people were still walking around. He did these miracles in open public. And so imagine the kind of hard heart you have to have to say, he saved others, let him save himself. If in fact he is the Christ, the chosen one, this is the voice of irreverent unbelief. The soldiers join in, verse 36, they also mocked him coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And so the, the clergy here are being echoed by the godless Gentiles. Look at verse 36 very carefully. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Most people read that and for some reason assume that the sour wine, which is essentially an admixture of vinegar and water, is an act of compassion in the midst of the mockery. Don't think that. That's not what's happening here. They're not being compassionate while they rail at him. Luke is making it very clear that the sour wine is part of the mockery. How so? Well, we learned from John's account that the implement that they used to deliver this sour wine to Jesus was a sponge attached to a hyssop branch. Now, let me just note that most people, when they envision Christ crucified, they envision Christ suspended, you know, five, six, eight feet off the ground. So that he's up there and not so. The vast majority of crucifixion victims were no higher than seven feet at the top of the cross. So it's not like they needed a sponge on a stick because they couldn't reach. So what was this sponge on a stick? Well... This was a very familiar tool in the Roman world, especially among Roman imperial troops. When Roman citizens would use the bathroom, whether in a public toilet or elsewhere, out in the woods, they would wipe themselves, not with toilet paper, that's a modern convention, rather they would wipe themselves with, with a sponge attached to a stick. It's called a chisorium or a xylospongium. And after having removed the filth from themselves, they would take that stick and they would put it in a jar of vinegar to serve as a disinfectant. They'd leave it there for the next person to use. Jesus is crucified outside of the city. There's not a public bathroom around. They've taken this implement in order, just in case the need arose and somebody needed to use the bathroom. And so in the midst of their mockery, they take what is essentially their toilet brush filled with filthy vinegar and they put that to the Lord of glory's mouth. And the shocking thing is that he drinks it. Why would he drink it? Surely something as ubiquitous as this, Jesus would have recognized. Why would he drink it? Luke tells us earlier in the gospel that 
that Jesus says he would not drink of the fruit of the vine, that is anything from a grape, again until he drinks it anew in the kingdom of God. The next time Jesus drinks anything from a grape is right here on the cross. Which means that the kingdom of God was inaugurated when Christ was on the tree. And that was the sign to you and I. Jesus drank that filthy vinegar off of their toilet brush to communicate to us that the kingdom of God is not a future thing, but a present reality. Not a kingdom of borders and castles, but a kingdom of redeemed souls who are empowered by the Spirit of God to redeem the lost. And so they mocked him. They mocked him both with their words, save yourself, and the inscription over his head. It's a trilingual sign. It says, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Ironically, he really was the King of the Jews. But why would they make it trilingual? Incidentally, Jesus is not merely the King of the Jews, is he? But he is... In his kingdom, there is both Jew and Gentile. That trilingual sign in Greek, Aramaic, and Latin typifying that point. And so while hanging here in agony, agony, one of the criminals, this is verse 39, who were hanged, railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Matthew's gospel notes that initially, both criminals were mocking him. But something has changed. The one criminal has had a change of heart. He's not saying anything now. The other one is still going. The other criminal rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed justly, were getting what we deserved. But this man has done nothing wrong. Something has happened to this man on the tree. Something has happened to him. Rather, someone has done something to him. The Holy Spirit of God has regenerated him. And he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The irony is, he was coming into the kingdom right then. And so Jesus responds saying, truly I say to you, that phrase, truly I say to you, occurs over 70 times in the New Testament. It's an emphatic, solemn utterance. Uh, the term translated truly is the uh, Greek term amin. It means essentially amen. And so when Jesus is really emphatic and serious about something, he wants somebody to take something to heart, he'll put his amen out front. Amen, I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. Today. That is to say that this criminal who lived his entire life in rebellion against God. Because he merely asked Jesus to remember him. Was given paradise. And so let me ask you. When you die, and your death is inevitable, so don't deny it. Don't act like it's not going to happen, because it will. And you go before the creator of all things. What will you say to him to gain entry into his presence? What will your argument be? What thing will you tell God to persuade him? To give you heaven. If you're going to go to the presence of God. After this life has ended. And you're going to say something like. I did this in your name. Or I did these good things. Or I, I gave money to this. Or I went to the church. Or I read the Bible. Or I, I helped these people. If that's what you're going to tell God. Heaven is not 
waiting for you in the future. Because those are the words of someone who does not understand the weight of their sin, nor the holiness of God. That person is trusting in themselves. They have faith in themselves. Rather, the only suitable thing to say to God on that day, the only appropriate thing to say to God when he says, why should I let you in my kingdom, is to say, I wasn't good. I sinned against you. I did things that were wrong. My heart was corrupt. But Christ was good for me. Christ lived righteously for me. Christ Atone for my sins, for me. And upon that basis, and that basis alone, heaven is possible for you and I. What would this thief say? He's got nothing to show God. Saved in the last hours of his life. Is he going to say, God, I did this, this, and this? Lived his entire life in rebellion. The only thing he can say, the man on the cross told me he would remember me. Which, by the way, that should remind you of an Old Testament story. Joseph, an exceedingly righteous man, unusually so. The favorite son of his father. Jesus is righteous, the beloved son of his father. Joseph ends up getting thrown into a prison, and there, uh, there are men who are going to, uh, or at least one of them is going to escape his sentence, and Joseph says to the prisoner, remember me when you get out, and he doesn't. He languishes away for years after that. But Jesus remembers. The Bible tells us that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is not merely to say the words, Lord, This is a call of desperation that involves a tacit acknowledgement of the fact that you have violated God's holy law. We must get beyond judging ourselves according to relative standards of goodness and say, well, I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I didn't say what she said. Rather, we need to judge ourselves according to the standard of God's perfect and holy law. And when we do that, we see that our acts, our works, even in our best moment, are as filthy rags unto God. It is only arrogance that persuades us of anything else. But there's only one criminal here who receives paradise. That's interesting. J.C. Ryle, the great Anglican bishop, said, One thief was saved that no sinner might despair, but only one that no sinner might presume. How many people I've talked to who conspire in their hearts to live the way they want to and at the end of their life seek peace with God. How many people I've talked to like that? How many young people, mostly? And the rationale, I understand it, the rationale says, I'm going to live how I want to live I'm going to taste the pleasures of this world. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to uh, scratch out my bucket list as it goes. And then, when I'm old, when I'm gray, then I'll go to God and ask for forgiveness. After I've used the best years of my life up, being Lord of my own little kingdom, then I'll go to God. And what I want to tell you today is if that's your plan, what's going to happen, in all likelihood, in your repeated turning away from the grace of God, God is eventually going to give you over to what you really want, namely your sin. He's going to stop calling your name. He's going to stop convicting you of sin. And that will be the end. Because it is only by the common grace of God that you have any awareness of your need for salvation in the first place. So if you think you can put this off, remember that there was one thief redeemed, not two. 
Don't be presumptuous to God. But there's another group of people who I can hear what you're thinking. At least this is what I would have thought. You don't know my life. You don't know the things that I've done and the depraved things I've thought and and the secret things I've kept hidden. You don't know my past. I don't believe it's that easy. I don't believe God's just going to forgive me just like that. I hear what you're saying if that's you. And what I would say to you is, Part of repentance is taking the Lord at, its wor- at His word. Part of repentance is recognizing the insurmountable value of Christ crucified for sins. And as much as one values an anchor only when there's a horrendous storm in the port, it's only when we see our sin for what it is that we see Christ for who he is. And so in the midst of this scene, verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour, that's 12 p.m., and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. What's going on here? Why is there this otherworldly darkness in the middle of the day? It is because the sufferings of Christ, the physical afflictions of Christ, were not the only thing that was going on there. Jesus didn't merely pay for sins by means of his physical afflictions, but rather, God was, in that three-hour time, pouring out the fullness of his white-hot, furious wrath against sin. Which means that God treated his son like he were the worst, most seedy, most shady sex trafficker that ever lived. Treating him like he's some kind of pimp. God was punishing his son as if he were the worst a child predator or pornographer or, or, or the worst, most selfish thief. God was punishing his son as if he were the most despised and cursed man who had ever lived. And the irony of it all is that he never did any of it. He never did anything wrong. This is what Paul means by... When he says, he who knew no sin was made to be sin on our account so that we might be the righteousness of God in him. Christ was the the stand-in, the atonement, the sacrificial lamb, the propitiation, the wrath taker. And in three hours time, Christ absorbed the full brunt of God's wrath, satisfying the Father's justice making a way for mercy to be had. And right then he says, calling out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Remember I said most people who die from crucifixion don't die from the wounds but from suffocation. But Jesus here dies calling out with a loud voice. That's because I don't think it was the cross that killed him. I think it was the wrath of God poured out on him. Because on that cross, for the first time in the history of existence, God turned his back on his son. What you see on that cross is a picture of the outcome of your sin. And what you see on the cross is how strongly God hates sin. So that Christ, being the one who was credited with our sin, was made an object of destruction. An object for God's wrath. And you see his fury at sin on the cross. But you also see the mercy of God. And that that furious wrath was was taken by Christ as he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, you know the rest of the story. Jesus is buried and 
uh, sort of hastily so because it's almost the Sabbath. The Sabbath begins around 6 o'clock formally on Friday uh, and uh, carries on till uh, sundown the next day. And so uh, Jesus is taken off of the cross by Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, but not like those that wanted him dead. And uh, he's hastily buried, put in the tomb. And the rationale there is that the women are going to come back later on Sunday after the Sabbath. And they're going to give Jesus a proper anointing for his burial at the tomb. What this would involve is the use of different spices. Uh, They would have wrapped him and bound the spices with him using linen. And so they go on the first day of the week on Sunday, verse 20, uh, chapter 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, at early dawn they went to the tomb. This is daybreak. Taking the spices that they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? What is the significance of Christ strolling out of the tomb? What's the, what's the takeaway of the resurrection? What does it mean for those of us who follow Christ? Because most of us get the cross. We understand our sin, God's wrath, poured out on Christ. We get that. But what about the empty tomb? The empty tomb is the surety, the evidence, that what Christ achieved on the cross was received and accepted by the Father. Not only that, Whereas on the cross, Christ crushed the head of the serpent, doing away with our sin. It's in the empty tomb that he does away with the last enemy, death itself. The resurrection is the reversal of the cross. The reversal of death. And in that reversal, what Christ has done, he has taken lordship over death and life itself. This is why... Jesus is depicted as this sort of otherworldly being in Revelation. His skin looks like burnished bronze, and his head looks, his hair looks like flames. It's just this miraculous and wonderful picture, but he's holding the keys to death and Hades in his hands. Not literally. What that intends to tell you is that Jesus is Lord of the grave. He's Lord of the grave, which means that those who follow Christ, just as Jesus was resurrected, those who follow Christ will be resurrected one day. Because he's the first fruits of the resurrection. And so the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is, number one, the evidence that Christ's mission of redemption has been accomplished and is being applied among us. Secondly, the resurrection is a portrayal of what we are to receive, those who follow Christ. And then thirdly, the resurrection of the dead is the article of faith, the doctrine upon which the faith of Christianity hinges. Why does it hinge upon the resurrection? Because if Christ didn't rise from the grave, neither will we. Eat, drink, and be merry, Paul says, because tomorrow we die. Which is why Luke goes through such great pains to describe the historical circumstances. Luke being an historian himself. And... To be honest with you, I recognize that people don't rise from the dead every day. And so with extravagant claims, like Jesus being resurrected, we need extravagant evidence. Here's the most compelling piece of evidence aside from the biblical text itself for me. 
these disciples, apart from Judas who went to his own place, initially, we're told, did not believe the account that he had been raised. The women go and tell him, there was two angels, he said, he's been risen, he's not here. The men don't believe it. Eventually, each one of these men, with the exception of one, is martyred because of their belief in the resurrection. I don't think these men were willing to die for what they knew was a lie. I don't think they'd be willing to die for a fabrication. Rather, the truth of the resurrection is exemplified and shown in the blood of the martyrs. And so the fact that Jesus defeated death tells us two big things. First, that death isn't the end for you and I. We make so many efforts to hide death in this culture. We go through extraordinary lengths. We even dress up the dead. There's a whole industry in making the death dead look good. We try to hide it. Don't hide the fact that you're going to die from yourself. Remind yourself of that. There's an old phrase, an old Latin phrase, remember your death. Remember your mortality. And when you remember it, remember the resurrection. Because in as much as you're going to die, one day you shall live. The second thing is, many of us have lost people we love dearly. Many of us have seen our brethren go before us in death. And our hearts are broken for it. And many of us have lost people that we can't even quantify the damage that has been done to us because of their, their loss. My word to you today is a word of hope that you will see them again in the resurrection of the dead. If you die in faith, you will be raised. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus didn't say, I might raise him up. I will raise him up on the last day. Which means whatever this world throws at us as Christians, the resurrection will reverse it. Whatever has been taken from you in this life, stolen from you, whatever damage done to you, Christ will effectively Reverse it in the resurrection. These are good reasons to worship God and to come to Christ for peace with God. Let us pray.